Thanks for checking out this movie review video. This is for the 2018 film Summer of 84, and this is a Shudder exclusive film, so you can only see it on Shudder streaming. Uh, I don't know if that's going to change in the future. Maybe not. So I actually attribute the non-popularity of this film for the most part to the fact that it was a Shudder exclusive back in 2018, because when it came out, yes, Shudder got popular in 2018 that's when they start really building a lot of momentum and they're very popular now but when summer of 84 hit in 2018 it wasn't during that time where it was really starting to gain traction so I think a lot of people ended up missing this film and I kind of want to get the word out there now that said I am doing spoilers in this review because it's from a from 2018 so if you haven't seen the film yet just stop here go watch it on shutter it's very good I totally recommend it then come back and you can kind of go through and nerd out with me on this. I uh, really like this film. So this film was directed by Francois Samard, Anouk Wissel, and Johan Carl Wissel, who they go by RKSS as a as a production company. And they've the other thing you might know that they did that's actually also available on Shutter, and I should do a review for, is the film Turbo Kid, which Turbo Kid is a lot of fun. It is very different from this film though uh, and I think part of the reason is they the people who directed um, Summer of 84 wrote and directed Turbo Kid they did not write Summer of 84 so who did write it Matt Leslie and Stephen J Smith who don't really have any other writing credits on IMDb but I don't understand why so much because this is a good script it is quite a good script in my opinion this film was actually considered by a lot of critics to be one of the best horror films to come out in 2018. Now, this is another reason why I'm saying people need to be watching this. And, you know, if you've gone this far in my review, you've probably already watched the film. But tell people about it. Tell your friends about it. It definitely deserves it. The music in this film sets things up very, very well, in my opinion, to establish an 80s era. Now, they do it to a degree with the, with the outfits that people wear. But the music is what really, really, really sets it up. So I really like that. In addition, the music is really well executed. It's really well put together. I think that's another great thing in Turbo Kid. They did a great job with the music there. I think overall that's something they do really well, the RKSS folks. So love the music in this. That's one of the best parts. The beginning with Davey talking about his neighborhood sets up a level of distrust and paranoia, which is very important for this film because that's kind of what it's all about, at least from the perspective of Davy and his friends. There's this distrust in the neighborhood, specifically Mackie, distrust of, our, and, and a level of paranoia because, you know, a potential serial killer being right there. But there's also distrust that comes down from the parents. There's also distrust from the kids going to the parents as well because they know they're not necessarily going to listen to them. Some of the kids actually have problems at home, so there's a level of distrust on that level too. So it's more it's really more than just a film about kids trying to solve a case of a serial killer. There's a lot more going on, and I'll talk a little bit more about that as we go on. Um this is this actually speaks to the time too, the fact that it's set in 84. This is the type of stuff that was becoming more known about in the news with serial killers being out there, mainly 70s, 80s, but also more child abductions, that being uh, something that was covered a lot more and people being more cognizant of it and being more paranoid about it. So it kind of captures a feeling from this time period, but it's viewing it more through the lens of the actual kids, not the parents. You see so much more watching it a second time, I wrote. Uh, like the photos of his family, the large family in the beginning in Mackie's house, and the layout of the basement, knowing that when, in the beginning, Davey's helping him move something down to his basement, behind that padlock door are two kids, one dead and one alive, which you, you know, obviously find out in the end. Um, so it, it, for that and a bunch of other moments, which I'll talk about, may, uh, maybe two more of those types of moments in here, uh, it's definitely worth a second viewing because certain scenes and certain dialogue has different context the second time you see it. It's more of like a vague foreshadowing of what's coming, or there's a double meaning there. There's something else going on between the characters. And, you know, like I said, I'll talk about that. The dialogue is very good in this. Uh, that combined with the acting makes these characters feel very real. It makes the relationships, the friendships between the kids feel extremely real. The only one that doesn't really feel all that real is a relationship between Davy and 
I forget her name, the babysitter that he had some years ago. That relationship feels not realistic, feels very forced and weird. That's the only big problem I have with this film is that that doesn't jive. That probably should, could have, should have been cut out of the whole thing because it doesn't really matter a whole lot to the actual story. So I think that should have been edited out. But other than that, dialogue is great. Acting is great. Um, script is really good. Davy's father is a reporter in this. Um, so you can see where he gets his desire to investigate and you feel like there has to be a deeper story with the disappearing of the kids. Um, that's where I think it's interesting to, to, to make sure you key into those types of things when they're kind of dropping in in the films. And I don't think I really picked up on that the first time. I picked up on that the second time that, you know, it's, it's mentioned quickly, but Davy's father is a reporter. So you can understand that that's kind of where Davy's mindset comes from. And I think that's thrown in there to set up the possibility of doubt for the audience of where, you know, Davy's coming from when he thinks that Mackie is a serial killer. You know, they could be like, oh, well, you know, he gets it from his father. He's naturally inquisitive. He, he feels like he wants to be like his father. He wants to be investigating things and solving things and looking into it like a reporter. I mean, they also do that by putting all those newspaper clippings up on his wall. It just shows that he's obsessed. And then also his friends talking about the fact that, oh, here you are with another conspiracy theory, you know. So it kind of discredits him to a degree. And that's important to kind of lay the track for there being some base level doubt about the things that he's saying. So it creates this awesome kind of push and pull throughout the entire film of you as an audience member thinking, okay, he, you know, Mackie definitely did it because of this, this, and this. But then getting those counterpoints of, well, you know, I'm not so sure that he did do it or thinking he definitely didn't do it because of these counterpoints. Really well done in that respect. Uh, this serves to remind people how different things are for kids now. Um, I don't think it was intentional from the film, but that's something that I pull out of it. Back then, the height of entertainment for these kids was actually hanging out outside and doing things like, I think you call it Midnight Manhunt, playing flashlight tag. That's what I knew it as when I was a kid. I actually wasn't able to participate in that because my parents were very strict, but all my friends were doing it, and those were the things that kids got excited about back then. Now, kids are mainly staying inside, and the excitement's like video games and YouTube and things like that. YouTube. Uh, the push and pull of evidence versus deniability, I talked about this a little bit, that Mackie is the Kate May Slayer is presented pretty evenly and actually at really good pacing. That's another aspect of it, what I was talking about, that not only is there a good amount of here's the evidence, here are the counterpoints to say maybe why he's not the killer, um, it's done at good pacing, so it's like point, counterpoint, point, counterpoint. It's never like here's all this evidence and then here's all the denial kind of, the things for denial just clump together. They pepper them in there and they kind of alternate pretty well that, you know, makes it like I was talking about where you're kind of pulled back and forth throughout the film of like, man, maybe he did it, maybe he didn't do it. And I love that. I love that because it keeps the tension high. It keeps it a mystery until close to the end and it just plays well. It's believable that kids of this age would do all the recon on Mackie and then have a very stupidly simple plan like, we can catch him and become famous. Like, they literally don't have a plan. They're just like, we did all this recon. We think it's him. Now we just catch him. And it's just this thing of like, yeah, that's how kids think. That's how kids, kids of that age think. They think they're invincible. They think they can do things like that. And they don't think things through because they're kids. They're young. They're immature. Like, that's... That's pretty realistic. So that speaks, again, to the good writing of the script. You get it pretty early on that Woody has a rough situation at home, which makes the film about more than just the serial killer investigation. Woody's home life drives him out of his house and into the sanctuary that is his group of friends. It's the um, treehouse, which he actually talks about, saying that if he could move in there, he definitely would, and he wouldn't have to go back home. But then you also get a little bit of that from the friend Eats um, towards the end. You don't get it early on. You know, you see he's kind of like a bad, he's more of like the bad kid, especially when they get pulled over in the car and the police officer's are like, oh, he, you know, not uh, Tommy, of course it's you, basically. Um, this just speaks to what I was saying before. It's It's about so much more. You know, it's about... These kids' backstories, it's about the trauma that they're having at home, the issues they're dealing with as well. And for that reason, it actually feels a lot like 
you know, a film like It, uh, Stranger Things, The Goonies. There's a lot of that type of stuff. It's about the kids' camaraderie, about them going on a adventure and solving a mystery, but it's also about their backstories and what they're dealing with in real life and the fact that their parents don't believe them, but they're trying to prove something. So all that stuff kind of plays together, which, by the way... Um, it's sheer coincidence that I happen to be wearing this today when I watch this. I did not plan this, so it's kind of weird. But hey, um, this also points out how everyone has a state of ignorance and innocence when they don't have the context or maturity to understand what they and their friends have going within their lives. You see that even though they talk about some things with Woody's hard home life and then later on with Eats, um, that these kids are kind of aware of it as their friends, but they don't go into it. It's just kind of more of like a, oh, you know, you don't want to spend time at your house, or they kind of know what they're going through, but there isn't that level of, how can I help you? What, it, you know, should we take this to someone else? Like, and that's normal. You know, that's totally normal. Like, kids, when you're much younger, you don't have that maturity, you don't have the innocence, you don't have the life experience to be able to look at what either you're going through or what others are going through and saying, oh, this is a bad situation. Uh, because that's what you're brought in, brought up in. Like, you just don't question it. It's just like, this is, this is just how life is. And then once you get much older, you start to realize that. I know I personally have had that happen to me in life with, you know, thinking that your family, your extended family is perfect and because that's just the way it is. And then going out and getting life experiences and meeting other people and realizing it's not um, because there are other ways that families function and other ways that people act. And, you know, normal is relative. So I think that's a that type of stuff comes into play in this film. And I think it does it in a good way. The whole situation with Nikki, like I was saying, the babysitter, I couldn't remember her name before. Good thing I wrote it down. Yeah, that just didn't feel realistic. I think that definitely could have could have and should have been cut out of the film. When Mackie gives the playing kids freezy pops, this is a very important moment that's kind of subtle. His expression slowly goes from the facade that he's giving to these kids of a happy, nice guy, neighbor, uh, to a very slow fade down to a very serious kind of disturbed look. And that's supposed to be the true him coming through, showing you that little glimpse that he is the Cape May Slayer. So I like that moment. I'm not sure I picked up on it the first time, but definitely the second time. The scene where Davy goes to Mackie's house to turn on the walkie-talkie, and he says, quote, this time I'm ready for you. Mackie says that, this time I'm ready for you. That's a veiled discussion about how he's on to him. It's a, also a foreshadowing about how things are actually going to go in the end. You know, uh, Davy and his friends are going at it. They're doing the investigation. They're getting the information. And they're going to be able to take him down, which they do to a degree. But he doesn't actually get caught. And in the end, he gets away. He almost kills Davy, but, you know, leaves him in a potentially even worse state, which I'll talk about later. Kills Woody. And that little exchange with 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 the walkie-talkie situation is a veiled one of he's basically saying to him in a coded way i know what you're doing and i'm taking precautions to counter that and things are going to end differently and like i was saying it's also a foreshadowing of where things are actually going to go it's kind of a turning point in the film in a subtle way after the kids get caught, they do a good job of casting doubt in the minds of the audience based on how nice and normal Mackie ends up seeming. And I think that lasts up until the time that he makes the phone call from Davy's house and Davy calls back and gets what phone number it was and realizes he called his own house. Um, so that, that I think, is then where you're like, oh, no, this guy is hiding it. He's definitely the dude. Uh, when the police chief says Davy is a hero... This is actually hearkening back to earlier in the film when Davy's parents were saying that Mackie is actually a hero. It was a situation where Davy's saying he's the killer, he's the Cape May Slayer, and his parents are saying, here you are thinking this person is a terrible person, but all along he's a hero because he caught that killer. Now, this is the inverse of that where the police officer is saying to Davy's parents, look, you thought that your kid was a bad kid that he was overreacting, that he had this crazy imagination. He's a hero. Um, so it's it's a cool juxtaposition in that situation. I dig it. Um, when Davy says, quote, there's nowhere left for him to hide, 
this is chilling at least the second time you watch it because literally at that moment, Mackie is above him hiding in the attic to come out later. You don't know that the first time you're watching it, so that line of dialogue just slips by. But on the second viewing, it is a chilling line of dialogue because you know that Mackie is above him and you know what's coming. And that makes it even more impactful and dreadful, really. Um, which, by the way, the moment where, you know, it's it's nighttime in Davy's house and then the you know, the stairs come down from the attic. As soon as those stairs started coming down, the first time I watched it, I remember just my eyes getting really wide and just having this oh shit moment uh, that I was just like, oh my gosh, this is, this is going bad. And that's a great sign because I, I don't get wrapped up in films like that a whole lot. So the fact that I got wrapped up in a film like, like I did speaks to how well done it was. So there is a great false false ending, which is the whole, like, everything's resolved, the kids are going to be fine. And that makes you even less prepared for Woody's death in the end of this film. Because you make this assumption that, okay, it's all tied up, everything's good, the kids are safe. We can breathe. The tension's done, everything's good. But you're not safe. So you're kind of at a moment where you're not prepared for what actually ends up happening. And I think that's kind of brilliant. I love it. The ending brings up a great question. In some ways, is it worse to survive something like this, always living in fear, and also, in this instance, living in the guilt with the guilt of being the one who survived? Because you know that Davy would go on to not just live in fear like was intended by Mackie, as he was telling him before he left, but also feeling guilty because he lived what he didn't live. And that's a very real thing. You know, I've listened to a lot of true crime podcasts and watched true crime shows, and that is something that legitimately happens with survivors is having those feelings that the person's going to come back, especially if they haven't been caught before. Um, having just PTSD, having issues dealing with trauma, anxiety, but also survivor's guilt. That's a real thing. And I think it's presented kind of well in this film by how um, Mackie talks about things before he actually leaves Davy alive. So the acting in this film is very good. I think it's really, really strong. Keeping up the tension and mystery is an important aspect of the film that's actually really done well. Uh, because with something like this, this is very thriller-like. You've got to do that. you got to keep up the mystery. you got to keep up the um, tension in order for people to really get sucked in. And they did. This is a good example of a film, uh, making a film with a very low budget that is good but you can do it because of some of the basics, doing the basics really well, like strong script writing, acting, directing, soundtrack, editing. All those things are super strong. This isn't a high-budget film, and you can tell, like, there's no crazy CGI. There's there's some practical effects, but there's not a ton. Um, so you can see that it didn't have to be a big-budget film, but it's really good, and it's really effectively done because the basics are really well done. This feels a lot like things like It, Stranger Things, and The Goonies, yes, and part of the reason being a lot of the trauma that's kind of alluded to in all those things, and especially here. Uh, they do a good job of keeping you wondering if Davy's, Davy's suspicion of his neighbor is legitimate or it's a kid's imagination. There are enough hints at where he could get false clues. Now, this kind of goes back partially to what I was saying in the beginning about his father being a reporter, um, you know, things like that. But also just kids being kids you know, and having imaginations. And I think that's obviously what his parents f fell into and a lot of the adults being like, oh, there's no way it could be Mackie. But in addition to that, just the fact that Mackie's a police officer and there are certain professions that as a society, we just think because this person is this perf a part of this profession, they're a good person. And that's not true. That's not necessarily true because People are individuals, and even in the instance of this film, it makes a very strong point that even though he was a police officer, it doesn't mean he was a good person because obviously he was a terrible person. He was using that as a facade. He was using that much like he was using the facade of being a nice neighbor to cover for what was truly going on. And that happens in real life. Prime example, Golden State serial killer. He was a police officer at one point. And when he was a police officer, I don't think he was killing people, but he was at least peeping on people and breaking and entering. At that point, I think he was the Visalia ransacker, maybe. I don't remember at what point he kind of moved over to the rape aspect of it, but it's just important to know 
that it's happened in real life. Um, this creates a good feeling of what it's like when you get into a situation where you know something is wrong with the situation, something terrible is happening, but nobody in a position to help is listening to you. No one believes you that there's a problem, but you know that there's a problem. Everyone's been there before, you know, to differing, differing degrees, even if it's something as small as in your office, you know, there's a decision being made about how work should be done or how, you know, work is processed or whatever, how you take care of clients. And you know, this is not the right thing to do. This is unethical. This is immoral. Or it's just a situation where it's just not going to work. And you know it, but nobody in a position to make a decision will listen to you. And then things play out. They play out poorly. And you're like, why couldn't someone have listened to me? That is clearly going on in this film. And everyone's experienced that at some point in their life, that feeling. So you feel it when you're watching the film. So the end of this, I think, is actually a really good setup for a sequel to the film. Um, but... I don't know if I personally would want a sequel. I think I'd be more interested in a prequel to this film. I want to know the backstories more. If there's one thing I really wanted more in this film, it's more explanation of what was actually going on in the kids' lives, but also the backstory of Mackie. How did Mackie first get started? How long was he really doing this? I mean, I know they allude to the fact that it was about, you know, 15 years that these kids were going missing, but that's only in that location. You know, you got to remember, this is the 80s. The police departments aren't very well connected at this point. So he could have just moved there 15 years ago, and that's when people from that area started disappearing. He could have been doing stuff prior to that out on the opposite coast of the country. Who knows? So I think a prequel would be really good to kind of get the backstory of the kids going on and then intercut that with the beginnings of Mackie as a serial killer and just go through a timeline so that you end it where Mackie moves into the neighborhood. I think that could be pretty interesting. Um, but, you know, give me your thoughts on that, thoughts on anything regarding this film or other stuff. You can put some comments down there. Um, my overall rating of this with a possibility of five stars, half stars in play, I'm going to give it a very solid four and a half star rating. I don't think it's a perfect film, but it is a really good film really well done and I really like it. I recommend this to people all the time, especially if they have Shudder and they're like, what should I watch on Shudder? Tell people all the time. Actually, um, subscriber Uncle Pete on here who comments on a lot of the videos as well. This came up because he was asking me one night um, over social media, uh, I got some free time, what should I watch? And I'm like, well, I know you have Shudder. Here's what I'd recommend. I recommended Summer of 84. He watched it. He messaged me about it the next day and was just like, man, that was really good. And he suggested we could talk about it for a live stream, which we might end up doing. And then that got me thinking, well, you know what? I want to rewatch it again because I know I didn't do a review on it. So that's how this came up. So thank you, Uncle Pete, for kind of getting that going. Um, but yeah, four and a half star film, really good. Highly recommend to a lot of people and you should too. But do me a quick favor, hit that subscribe. Uh, if you like any videos I do, you appreciate what I'm doing. Literally takes you a second and is totally painless. I would appreciate that. Uh, but if you are going to hit the subscribe, make sure you hit the notification bell too. That way you know whenever I'm putting up new reviews, unboxings here and there, and then when I'm doing the live streams as well, it'll let you know when I am live so you can jump on if you want to, which we're having fun doing that. But um, if you've already subscribed, just hit that thumbs up. Just let me know you're still watching. But regardless, thanks for taking your time watching this. Uh, and until next time, keep it brutal.